Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. All right, welcome to the third day of the Complexities of Time. My name is William, and I'm a theoretical physicist, currently a postdoc um, working with Professor Chu Lok Yu. Um, let me first announce that there, we have a guest today, um, Makrit Vonon, the ambassador of Netherlands. So welcome to Singapore. All right, so I think everyone here, like myself, have enjoyed the uh, conference so far. We have two more speakers today, this morning. Um, first up, we have Professor Van Wassenhoff. All right, she is a neuroscientist from France. She did her PhD in the US, followed by a couple of postdocs. Eventually, she returned home to France to be um, the group leader for brain research dynamics. So one of her expertise is in MEG. Right, and I think it is really fascinating to know that MEG is a cutting-edge method to study brain activity. And um, one of, this is a non-invasive method to study brain activity, and the way it works is it measures the very feeble magnetic field generated by the brain. All right, and as a theoretical physicist, I'm sure you would immediately realize that the Earth's magnetic field is many orders stronger than Femto Tesla, which is the magnetic field generated by the brain. So I think it is really cool that Professor Van Wassenhoff gets to work in this room that chews off magnetic field, <laughs> all right? And so if one day I were to lose my job as a theoretical physicist, I will be a neuroscientist and I know who to look for. All right, so without further ado, let us welcome Professor Van Wassenhoff. <laughs> Thank you for this nice introduction. <laughs> I'll keep you in mind. Um, <laughs> so uh, first I would like uh, to say that I'm very honored to be here. That's my first time uh, here in Singapore, in Paralimes. I would like to uh, thank Jan for the invitation. It's been wonderful today so far, and uh, hopefully you will, will keep on the trend. Uh, and I hope you also enjoyed the museum yesterday. I think it was a wonderful visit also. So, um, I am going to talk about the human brain. I think, oops, I think all of you had time to reflect on the uh, citation I put here. Just to give you context, uh, Julien Offray de la Maîtrise is a contemporary to uh, René Descartes, who is much more well known, and he's a materialist. So, uh, his argument is basically that we need to be explained uh, thinking just like we need to, be ex to explain time uh, in the brain or why we perceive time in some ways. So uh, I will try to go through these four points today. I will likely run out of time, so I apologize in advance if I skip slides because I do want to go to the end. I will try to spend a bit of time on the uh, considerations of time and the brain because there are specificities. Then I will talk about serial ordering or how, how uh, basic uh, sensory events can be ordered in the brain and perceived as, as such. I may have time for discussing a little bit about neural oscillations or brain rhythms, and then I will finish with uh, ordering events, but or the time arrow, conscious time arrow, with mental time travel uh, experiments. So as we heard a lot uh, in the last uh, couple of days, we've been using the word time in many different contexts or for specifying many different things. Um, here, as a cognitive neuroscientist, we're basically trying to, I apologize for this, okay, the, okay, which one is the, sorry, I'm trying to find the pointer, okay, somehow it's changing both, pointer when I point, good. yeah, but when you point, it changes both, so what I'm going to do is not use the USB, and just use the pointer, okay, that way it will solve the problem. So, um, so we've heard about time, and basically we're trying to understand how a complex temporal dynamics in the world are going to be encoded by the brain and eventually decoded or give rise to our conscious awareness of time. But when we use time, we use it to mention, for instance, the temporal statistics of the environment or duration, or to communicate or synchronize with each other of the order, rhythm, and often we do these shortcuts of time, using time to specify some other properties of time or properties of events. In fact, when you look at the association, when you look at the association that we make, so this is drawn from a real study that you can find online and you can play with this. 
when you present to the English native speakers the word time and you ask the association that you make with this word, you will see all of these different associations, which have been classified by color here. And you can see that most of our representation for time has to do with some form of duration based. So we watch, we uh, time flies, we measure passage, day, hour, minute, and so on. All of those are some forms of quantifier for time, but there are also the counteracting, the space and future, which I would consider metaphor, and the now and fast, which are more speaking about the speed. So this is sort of a semantic network for what we mean when we talk about time. And since time is both uh, ubiquitous and also ambiguous, we've heard also, is time an illusion, right? So I'm going to try and see whether you actually experience an illusion. I'll let you look at this. Now, was the red arrow shorter or longer than all of the other ticks? Did it appear to you to be slightly longer? So, because the thing is, I cannot do it again, otherwise you, now you're going to expect. The idea in this illusion is that when you have the surprise of an event that hasn't happened yet, then it tends to draw your attention to it, and then you're going to have sort of a time dilation. That is, it, it looks as if it were longer, but in fact they were all the same duration. So that's what we call chronostasis of time dilation, so to speak. Now, the other form of illusion that you can have um, is some of experiments, there haven't been so many over the course of years, where you desynchronize yourself from societal time. So one of the famous ones is Michel Sif, who was a speleologist or geologist, who went into caves and isolated himself for a couple months. And when they took him out of the this cave where he had access to absolutely nothing, he actually thought that half of the time had uh, been spent in the cave as compared to uh, what the real time was. That is, your intuition would be that when you're isolated from the external environment, you would be pretty bored because nothing happens, there's no changes, you're in the dark, you don't communicate with anyone. But in fact, it's the opposite. But this effect is something that is more relevant to chronobiology where your clock is basically slowing down and so your perceived time overall on the scale of days is actually slowed down. And there's been a few experiments like this that have been done in called isolation room or bunker experiments that have shown the same property. But interestingly enough, if you ask the participants or you train participants to go uh, into this bunker uh, by having taught them uh, how to produce a duration of roughly 10 seconds, and then you isolate them, you will see appearing again some strange inter-individual variability, namely that each participant will start producing these 10 seconds at different rate. So some of them are going to now overestimate and some of them are going to underestimate. And there's a huge variability in terms of how you produce time this time. So is time really an illusion then? Is it really so subjective and flexible? Uh, in a different experiment, what we asked uh, participants, so if you were a participant in this experiment, I would ask you, can you produce 1.45 seconds? I would not train you and you just press a button when you want and when you think 1.45 seconds has passed, you press the button again. And you do this over and over on, on many trials. And this is here the distribution of the data you get. So here you have the actual duration that was produced or self-generated. And here you have the uh, uh, amount or the number of, of uh, trials in which this duration was uh, 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 made. And you can see that it's pretty well, the distribution is quite Gaussian and pretty well centered on 1.5. So participants are not totally off. They're not going to do 10 seconds or, or five seconds or so on. But even more interesting, in this experiment, what we also ask participants is after producing this duration to self-rate whether they were too short or too long. So now you produce a duration and I'm asking you, do you think you were too short compared to what I asked you to do or were you too long? And sure enough, participants can do that. And they do that so well that this correlation here shows you how good you are at making what we call a metacognitive inference, that is being conscious of your own timing error as a function of the time that you actually produced. This is on grand average data, and these are the kind of distribution you get for each individual data and over time. So in other words, not only do you produce roughly around a good 
timing, 1.5 seconds, let's say, in this experiment. But on top of it, after you've done it, you know that you were too short or too long. Now, if you really think about it, it's a very trivial experiment in the field, but it gives a very neurophilosophical problem, so to speak. If you knew that you were going to be too short or too long, why didn't you calibrate? And then how do you know this objective time? Well, how, how is that value coming from, since I did not necessarily train you, right? And one second, you might have learned that in the course of your life, but 1.45 seconds, it's not really known. Okay, so this was to give you a bit of a taste with the kind of data uh, we, we are confronted with. And as a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, we have a big problem, a very general problem, but specifically a big one, of, of course, with time. Uh, so cognitive neuroscience wants to understand how the mind, which could be uh, disembodied, so to speak, or whatever gives rise to the mind and the stability of our conscious experience is being, is, rises from the neurobiology, so from this complex dynamic system, which is the brain. And of course, this complex dynamic system is inscribed into physics. It's not totally devoid of any physical properties. So of course, it has to somehow link with what we know of physics. So I'm going to go back to some of the intuition that I'm sure a lot of you, if you've worked on time, know by heart. Uh, one of the famous persons being cited often is Saint Augustin. And Saint Augustin basically tells us that we live in the present. And present of things past are memory, present of things present are sight, present of things future are expectations. And although physicists sometimes cite Augustin, I think that he provides a very nice definition of what the psychology of time is. That is, the brain is always in the now. It's in the now from the external observer point of view. So the dynamics that I'm observing here as a neuroscientist looking at the brain means that in the time frame of physics, I'm in the now, always. But mentally, I can myself think about the past or the future. So somehow they are representation of time that are also in that system which is in the now from the external observer point of view. Now the second intuition that we have of course of history is Romanes, who was a philosopher contemporary to William James, a couple years before William Jace published his very famous work on, uh, on consciousness, it is indisputable that our consciousness of a passage of time is determined by our consciousness of the sequence of events, time consciousness being nothing more than the memory of a series of successive changes in consciousness. This basically describes what we usually and informally call the time arrow in the mind. And the reason I am citing these two uh, different views is that this one now relates to more this, of this intuition about past, present, future. So even though my brain is in the now, I can in fact be in this time arrow of past, present, future. But these are also two different ways of considering time. This one talks to us about the duration based. So I think yesterday I attended a talk from a student who discussed about Husserl's view, which was a very nice uh, philosophical talk. And basically, this notion of extended time, or thickness of time, or duration, this is also what St. Augustine is talking about. But Romanes is more talking about an event-based, he's more frequentist, so to speak, and, and, and looks at sequences of events. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this event-based here. So I will ask for forgiveness to physicists because I use something that could be interpreted as being very uh, provocative, but I think the intuition is, is what I want you to, to think about. Basically, if we think of, let's, okay, let's take the example of a brain again. I'm an external observer, I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm looking at the brain. This brain has a birth and it has a death. It is an event in the timeline that I'm looking at. It has a duration. It's specified, so this event, which is the life of a brain, is going to be defined by its coordinate in space-time from the physical point of view, right? And it has a past, it has a future when I look at it. And so basically the idea here is to consider the, the time as a dimension that gives you a coordinate system, so to speak. And the duration of this event is simple to compute, right? If you know its coordinate on a temporal dimension at time E at the initial time and at time F at the final time, from an external point of view, you simply compute the difference and you have a duration. So why am I saying this? Is that I would like to consider time not as a measurement, I mean I will consider it also as a measurement, but let's try and think that time is a dimension in the mind and in the brain. Since the brain is always in its now, and that I can think about the past or the future, it has to have its own internal referential system and metric system. At least that's the proposal. 
So to make the comparison, whatever dynamics you may think about that we can record in the brain, and I will show you some examples, may in fact naturally provide the temporal referential system. The dynamical properties of the brain are going to give you this referential. And the time as measurement is all of the phenomenology of time that we can have, duration, order, simultaneity, and I will show you some of them. So the idea is, is simply to think about time in the brain as the capacity of the brain to build some temporal metrics to measure in these metrics the um, changes of events, for instance, or the mapping of these events. So the idea is to find what is that stab stable referential system and what are those kind of metrics that it's going to be using. This is a bit of a long introduction, but this is important because that's a bit of the framework I'm going to uh, think about. Uh, usually, when you go and hear about time perception in the brain, the taxonomy that is being used is basically paralleled with that of physical time. So people will talk about millisecond scales, second scale, minute scales, and so on, and describe in a purely physical terms in some ways what is our perception of time. The alternative in cognitive neuroscience is to try and find these operations that are peculiar to our perception and then draw or infer from there which time scales might be relevant or which computations in the brain might be relevant. And there are in the field at least two categories of time temporal phenomenology, one which we call preverbal, which is more to deal with the feeling of time passing, for instance. So simultaneity order, some of the primitives of temporal perception might be computed at a preverbal stage. You don't need to, be, to have a very elaborated mind to get there. And then you have some that are much more uh, uh, elevated, like for instance, potentially metacognition, the example that I show you where you're capable to say whether you're too short or too long, this sort of thing. Now I'm going to switch to em actual empirical data and I'll start with neural oscillations. And I'm going to skip a couple slides so I can move on. So <coughs> astronomers in the 19th century realized really early on that there were errors, systematic errors by the astronomers when they were trying to map the stars in the sky. And they call that the personal equation, which is basically an error that they did not, could not attribute to instrumental measurement or atmospheric conditions or whatever conditions are necessary for these sort of things, but uh, simply to a bias in the, uh, in the participant or some form of, of strange noise coming from the astronomer himself. The reason I'm uh, interpreting this is that, strangely enough, in psychology, there was no what we call longitudinal study. So when you want to know whether an individual has a particular bias in its perception, you need to sample them several times in the course of time, right? During months, years, days, to see whether it's stable. So with a PhD student, Leticia Grabo, uh, that's what we did. And what we do in the lab, basically, you present two stimuli to a participant. This represents a sound, this is a flash. And you ask the participant, depending on the delay of the audiovisual events, whether they were, um, which of these two, sorry, came first. So you have, for instance, a sound on the left, a visual flash on the right, and then you ask participant, was the left stimulus or the right stimulus coming first? And then once you do this, so you do this over and over, and you vary the trials, the delay between the uh, audiovisual, you build what we call the psychometric curve. So here you have the percentage of uh, so the number of times participants replied flash first, the flash came first, as a function of the delays that you varied, that you manipulated. And usually you, you get this sort of sigmoid curve, and the 50% point means that the participants were not able to tell whether the sound or the visual event was first. So that's the point of maximal ambiguity for you, which basically means it's your point of simultaneity. Your system is saying, okay, here I'm, I am a chance. I don't know whether the sound or visual event was first. So that's, we infer that it's simultaneity. Now it's known by, for one century now, through Tichner's law, famous psychologist, there's a law of prior entry. And this is a really cool law because what it tells you is that if I say now in this sort of uh, condition, pay attention to the sound, you're systematically going to perceive the sound first because you pay attention to it. So in other words, your brain is capable of changing the order in which it's going to perceive the uh, visual, visual auditory event. So the way we show that is you, uh, well, the way it's materialized in terms of the uh, data that we get is that you have a shift of that curve to the left or to the right. So let's see what that means. 
If you pay attention to the sound, which is in blue, your curve shifts to the right, which means here that the visual event has to be presented before the sound for you to reach simultaneity, because you have to compensate physically for this delay now. And you can do the same, and so the, the, the threshold, the perceptual threshold changes. If you pay attention to the visual event, you now have to present the sound first, because, because you pay attention to the, the uh, sound, the visual event has to be compensating for your a priori, so to speak, in, in anticipation of seeing that sound. Okay, so what we wanted to ask now is, this is on average, this is on 15 participants, let's say. That's the average data. But you can see that there's quite a lot of variability. So what we asked now is if we systematically bring the participant to the lab and we do all kinds of conditions where we control for attention and so on, does that participant has a threshold that is stable over time? Or does it really fluctuate all the time, right? So that's what we did, and we have different measurements. I won't go into details. Here you have each participant that has been tested four times. So each of the dots is four different sampling. With the same, uh, and these are the perceptual threshold. So these participants here would require the sound to be presented 100 milliseconds before the visual event to perceive the, visu the simultaneity. Here, this participant would require the visual event to be presented more than 100 milliseconds before the sound to perceive simultaneity. And you can see that the variability across individuals is much larger than the variability within individuals, which is a jargon term to say that basically there is stability in the way you perceive simultaneity. And more interestingly, because I told you that manipulating attention can vary this uh, threshold around, we also tested this over time, and you can see the gray zone here is the amount to which each subject can actually vary its threshold of simultaneity. And the most interesting part here is that not everyone aligns, aligns on the zero. So if I transcribe this in, in, in layer term, what that means is you could think of the capacity of the brain to use attention to compensate for the sort of delays that, for instance, Emirzik talked about uh, yesterday, or a couple of days ago, I forgot. Um, to compensate the different of asynchronies in the brain. For instance, the latency of arrival of sound and vision are all desynchronized in the brain. So attending to events may enable you to compensate for these delays. But if that was the case, it would also allow us to compensate for our inherent delays and be synchronized all to whatever objective zero might mean. But that's not the case. Even if you try to compensate, not everyone reaches that zero. In other words, everyone has some form of intrinsic bias in their system that leads them or yields them to perceive one thing before another, so to speak. Okay, then we went to brain um, activity to try and figure out how that worked. So there was this very nice introduction made and I'm going to show you uh, here, this is the, effectively the technique I use, MEG and EEG. Uh, it was mentioned we're in the Pico Femto Tesla range and the magnetic uh, field of the Earth is in a micro Tesla, so it's really an order of magnitude different. Um, I will pass briefly on this and explain to you the kind of measurements we do with this. Uh, so with MEG, which stands for magnetoencephalography, we basically have time series. We have many time series in, uh, over the scalp. And you can look at them. Uh, we heard on the first day uh, this sort of 1 over F of power law. So we do see in the MEG signal, even when you're at rest, when the subject doesn't do anything, this sort of increased power in the low frequency and decreased power in the high frequency. And what you can see here is a peak. And so there are peaks of activity which are referring to neural oscillation, which are oscillations. Basically means brain rhythms at a particular frequency that are spontaneously um, uh, there and observable. So basically when we look at neural oscillations, we model them as a perfect sinusoid, which is obviously an approximation, but that's okay. And the kind of information we can get from this is the amplitude of the, re of the response signal, the frequency, so how fast that, that response is, and the phase, the moment in that oscillation at which events happen, for instance. So, one of the um, most interesting oscillation is alpha, um, which is the peak that you see naturally at resting state. And alpha means that basically every 100 milliseconds, you have a fluctuation of activity in the brain that spontaneously occurs. So every 100 milliseconds, you have 
possibly a refresh. And some of the uh, um, hypotheses in the field is that this sort of refresh is in fact inhibitory. So the more alpha you would see in the brain, the more inhibited or the less information can get in. It's almost like a gatekeeper, so to speak. And this is the general intuition behind it. So I don't want to go into the details and I'll just put on the message for this uh, structural bias that I mentioned that we just saw in the behavior. Uh, when we did the MEG experiment on this, what we found is that this natural oscillation and it, the magnitude of its change before the presentation of stimuli was correlated with the, um, so to speak, amount of efforts your brain needs to deploy to go against its intrinsic bias. So basically, neural oscillation are as if you were trying to go against the natural structure or the passive conduction of information in the brain and inhibits, when needed, the entry for one or the other sensory stimuli. By the way, I'm okay if you ask me a question. I don't know if it's authorized, but you can ask me and interrupt me. I'm fine with that if you want to ask questions. Okay, now I'm going to go into more oscillations. And I'm going to stay with this notion of uh, timing, simple, simple stimuli for now. So there is um, another phenomenon, perceptual phenomenon, which is called temporal recalibration. And I'm sure all of you have experienced it. So when you go see to the movies and you have a very badly dubbed movie, you usually have, you can have delays between the sound, the incoming sound and the visual video. And typically for a few seconds, it's extremely annoying. You detect that there are differences in the, in the delay between the sound and the visual event. And in the course of the movie, you sort of forget about it and everything seems to be in sync again. In fact, you don't really think about it. I don't know, many of you must have experienced this sort of thing. So we brought this to the lab, but in a very minimalist way. So we simply use beeps and flashes again. And then you present the, the sound and the visual event for a minute, and they're desynchronized in time. So for instance, you have A is for auditory and V is for visual, say you have 200 some milliseconds of delay, and you present this for a minute. You ask before the experiment uh, the simultaneity of uh, the perception of simultaneity of participants before and after this, what we call this adaptation. And it was shown by different groups in the past that your capacity to now uh, measure simultaneity is going to be more tolerant. So it's as if your window of simultaneity has opened because you've been adapted to this desynchrony. So I have a cartoonish picture of this because that's essentially why conceptually it's interesting because the experimental paradigm is quite boring, right? Uh, basically it means in the external world, I'm presenting you with two stimuli that are 200 milliseconds apart. By the end of uh, one minute in which I have adapted you with sensory stimuli, your representation of the sound and your representation of visual event has come into closer in time. So the mind represents this as being closer in time than what it is physically. And that's this process which we want to try and understand. To do this, we use MEG, so that's how it looks like. It's basically, uh, you sit under a DUR, it's as if you were at the uh, hair, uh, hair cutter or so, and um, having your hair dry. And basically, we have sensors that are hidden here in, in uh, liquid helium. So we do this experimental paradigm that consists in basically, these are just uh, jargon and terminology, but we measure participants' temporal order, like we did in previous experiments. Then we adapt them for a few minutes. Then we measure again their temporal order. When, then we adapt them again to a desynchrony, and so on and so forth. And we present the audio and the visual event at a rhythm of one hertz, meaning every second you have a stimulus that is a sound visual event. And when you do this to the brain, so I'll cut to the chase here, have a look here. What happens is that you're going to have a brain response that is going to be what we call entrained. So you have an external clock, this rhythm that you ping the brain with, and the brain is going to respond in this entrained manner, so growing its intensity, and then eventually what we call locked to the external rhythm. So you have uh, time locking or a clocking mechanism, so to speak, that is entrained by the external rhythm. How does that look like in the data? It looks like this. 
So before I showed you what we call a power spectrum, so the distribution of frequency as a, and, and their amplitude, here we presented a rhythm at one hertz, and you start seeing emerging a peak of response at one hertz. That's the oscillation that we entrained or that we uh, uh, um, induced in brain response. If you look at it over time, that's how it looks like. Because you have an audio and visual event, you have what we call an evoked response. So you have a big response at the onset of a stimulation. The brain is aware or encodes the fact that something has changed in the environment. And then you have this sort of oscillation here over time, which is what we manipulated in the experiment, in a sense. So you have two types of response. Our hypothesis was that if you do have um, this sort of phenomenon happening in the brain, there are two options. Either when you, phase, when you lock the brain response to the external clock, there's no change at all. It's what we call stationary, formal stationary, I think, in, but physicists can correct me. Or you have some form of non-stationarity in the phase. So our hypothesis was that the phase of the oscillation may be important for encoding time in the brain. And so if in the ideal case, in, in, in this case in particular, you would expect that the, by the, when you compare the beginning and the end of the experiment, you should see a change in the phase of the oscillation that would correspond to your percept, your change in percept, if that was the case. So the way it works is that we look at data before, the big, at the beginning of the adaptation, data at the end of the adaptation. We have this sort of graph which basically look at the phase. What we find is indeed a correlation, but only in the auditory cortices. So this here means that you had, in fact, a change. So when I say a change in the phase, it means, as you can see here, between the blue and the red line, you have a slight shift in the timing. So if I'm in the external observer case here, I can record that there is a change in the timing response of the brain, even though I'm entraining it with a clocking mechanism outside. And same thing here. So for this quadrant here, what it means is that when the phase shifted to the more negative, it means that you have an advanced in time. And participants needed the uh, visual event to be presented first to compensate for this advance in time. So each of these dots here is a different participant. And what you see as a linear correlation here is the capacity of the brain to sort of compensate for the um, delay, physical delay, that the participants need to see physical simultaneity. I'm going to cartoon, cartoon this again because uh, I think this can speak easily to physicists, but it's my, a neuroscientist, but maybe less to general audience. This is the profile of the second response. So I showed you that there was an oscillation, and on top of this oscillation, there was an evoked response, which we called phase locked. And this one did not change as a function of adaptation. And why it's important is because of this cartoonish sort of, uh, this was, by the way, the thesis of uh, Anne Kusem. So it was a lot of work, actually. Um, so what's happening here, what I'm the story I'm trying to tell you is that if I am an external observer and I use my linear time, like the veridical time as the scientist to map time, and if my brain is using this, both the brain and I are seeing this event here, which is the phase locked, the evoked response, as not changing. But what we captured is that when you, uh, by the end of the adaptation, when I mentioned that there was a phase delay, what that means is that this oscillation here for the external observer has changed. And for the brain, it has allowed to map this event at a different timing than in the initial response. So basically, oh, sorry. What matters is, he, if this is a coordinate system, if this oscillation provides you with a temporal metric, this response has changed position in this oscillation. And that's the idea here, that the event is being mapped in an oscillatory time matrix. OK. Do you have any question? Usually, I have a lot of questions here to clarify. The data comes from the end of the experiment and it's already adapted to the yes. state. And what happens when you see that not only in, in when they press the button, but also in the brain waves. Yes. Way. So the idea is to look at this in the brain in the brain in terms of what what dynamics has changed between the beginning and the end. And the hypothesis right now in the field is that when you have this sort of 
clock, external sensory clock that is being given to the brain, you usually, your brain response is going to be time locked. That is happening always at the same time in response. So you have stimulus response, stimulus response, and so on. And the latency of that response should be systematically happening at, say, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds after the sensory stimulus happened. And the prediction in here was that it would be systematic over time. Our prediction was that somehow a form of latency response would vary by the end of the experiment to explain that shrinking of time. That was, and that's what we observe, only in the auditory cortex. So there's another way, because yesterday I also heard about a talk where the Bayesian, uh, Bayesian, Bayesian computation were used. There's another way of interpreting this, which would not be time. Another way to interpret this would be, in this experiment, you systematically have a visual event in front of you, and then you have a sound that's being displayed through headphones. When you have a visual event in front of you, you have 100% certainty that this visual event is at a certain distance from you because the visual system is specialized and expert in computing these spatial metrics. When I'm providing you with a sound through headphones, what happens is that the sound is as if it was coming from inside your head, which is totally unecological. So you have full uncertainty for the auditory system of where that sound come from, comes from. Sorry. So when you keep on showing this sound flash, sound flash, sound flash, the brain keeps on thinking, okay, there's an object out there that is unique, and I have to infer its cause. I have to infer what, why this information comes in. And so it can perfectly use this systematic, even if it's shifted in time, it can still use the systematicity of occurrence of sound and vision to infer causally through a Bayesian prediction that we have the same object out there. So the auditory system tries to calibrate both the space and time. You can, you can uh, interpret it as a spatial also. Um, right. I will keep on this discussion, and now I'm going to transport you in the totally extreme uh, of mental time travel. So, so far I've been talking to you about very boring stimulus like flash and events, flash and, and beeps, and you're thinking, well, well you know, I don't do this every day, and what, why does it matter exactly? Okay, so I'm going to try to talk about paradigms here that you likely do a little bit more every day, but of course, because we're doing controlled experiments, it's also very, a bit, you know, uh, uh, not, not, so na not as natural as you would do. Okay, um, so I just talked about time and space, and, and there's a lot of discussion in the field about the possibility that uh, time and space are represented using the same sort of mechanisms in the brain. Um, it's not totally recent to think in that terms, but it's also, um, there are different lines of thoughts that, that arrives to that conclusion. One of them, I think, finds its root in a MacTaggart dis distinction from the early 20th century between the, what is called in philosophy A series and B series uh, that are two different visions of what time is like. So if you think about time, you could think of yourself as basically an event which is having different position in this external timeline, or you can be this fixed entity, the I, the self, through which time comes through. So the difference is also called presentism and internalism. Different way to look at this is that even, or to, to see that we have, in fact, the very fact that we already have these two conceptions of time mean that we, we can actually conceive them, right? So why can we even conceive them? So one option is to have is to appeal to the linguistic system and the metaphoric approach, knowing that our language constrains us to think about time in spatial terms. And that's an hypothesis that's been uh, nicely raised by Lera Boroditsky, uh, where basically it would, it, would be, it would stem from this, uh, from this approach. And then there are others, and here I'm doing um, publicity for a colleague, Dean Buenomano, who has a nice, uh, nice book that actually discusses this more. So experimentally, how can you go about uh, addressing these sort of things? You can do it very simply with a behavioral experiment. So for instance, you display these sort of uh, pictures. So this is an experiment that was done by a Boroditsky group. And she had an apple that she presented to, uh, to uh, participants in different order. And then she asked them to basically order them as they wished. And depending on your uh, culture, you're going to order them from left to right or from right to left. So in the Western, so in France or in English, you would order them from left to right as the apple is not eaten yet to the future. The apple has been eaten. 
And if you're Hebrew, you're going to do the reverse. Like, so you're going to put the eaten apple first on your left, and then you go all the way to the, future, to the past, which will be on your right. And I should reverse because I'm facing you. So you have to do mental rotation to, <laughs> to go with it. But OK. And then, and then there are other kinds of, uh, of sort of specialization of your mental representation of time, which is, for instance, in the Aymara. Uh, uh, people where the future, so for me as a French person, the future is, tends to be more in front of me and the past is in the back, but for them the future tends to be behind and the past is in front. So each of you, we have uh, lots of different cultures in the room, you can uh, uh, see how it fits with your own uh, intuition behind that. So this is a, there are lots of different experiments pointing out to the idea that you may have a correspondence between time and space. And there are others which are like uh, quantity that uh, from yourself, from Vincent Walsh uh, idea, but I won't go there because I'm not talking about quantity. And so more recently, uh, because uh, in, there's been lots of uh, very new findings in the field, you know that uh, I think it was last year there was a Nobel Prize for chronobiology, but a couple years ago there was another Nobel Prize for what has been called the GPS system in the brain, which is the navigation, how the brain navigates space. And two prominent scientists, uh, Yogi Bujaki and Edvard Moser, so Edvard Moser is one of the Nobel laureates, uh, thought that, okay, we sort of solved the, the space, and people are talking about time and space, so perhaps this complex system to map space is being used also to map time. And in humans, in particular, it might be used to project yourself in time, so mentalize yourself in the past or in the future and so on. So is, are the computational operations that are being used for mapping time in your mind akin to what is being used when you try to navigate space. That's sort of a, a big hypothesis they put on. So we were interested in this and we did this experiment where actually this came out as when we were doing the experiment. So this is the experiment that we ran with Baptiste Gauthier. And it's in English this time. Okay. So this is going to sound like a weird experiment because I really thought participants could not do this, but they can do it really well. So first they come to the lab and we give them historical events. They're real. They happened in the past or they will and they were planned to happen in the future. Uh, here I'm highlighting, for instance, the building of a dam in India, which was planned. So we ran this experiment in 2010, I think, uh, collected the data in 2010. So it was seven years in the future. And now we passed that, so I'm not sure whether it happened or not, but it was planned to happen. So participants were asked to learn these events, there's 36 of them, to learn when they, they occurred, and then to be able to position them on the Google map here. So this is the dam building in India, and we gave them a few sentences about the contextual, contextualization of this paradigm, right? Like, well, what is this event about? Why is it interesting? And so on to sort of get them hooked to the, to the paradigm. And, we, and these events were distributed a little bit around the world uh, with respect to the now and here. So now and here for me was, now was 2010, and here was Paris. And then what we asked them is two kinds of tasks. One task in space, one task in time, but the tasks are extremely similar in terms of what we could posit as cognitive operations, so the sort of computation the brain would do. What we asked them is to mentally travel in space or in time. So we would say something like this. Imagine that you are now in Paris. And, no, you are in Paris, but I want you to think of yourself in Paris in nine years. And once you're there, I want you to do a ordering task. So I'm going to show you a historical event. You're nine years ahead in Paris. Is this historical event before or after where you are in the future? So for instance, is the election of Barack Obama before or after where you are in the future? Or we could do in space the equivalent, imagine you're now, but you're in Dubai. Has the election of Barack Obama occurred in the east or in the west of where you stand? Okay? And you do this on events that you've learned over and over and over. And as you see, you, we have distributed events. So we, what we can measure is the order, so whether things were before or after, how you think they were, and also the distance with respect to where you are. So when you do this, and I've, I've heard, I uh, don't remember someone mentioning uh, Shepard's uh, experiments on mental rotation, the kind of effects we get here are interestingly opposite of what uh, Shepard's experiment showed. And I'm happy to discuss this because it's, it's uh, interesting. That's a s side uh, thing. So 
But what essentially that means, that little comment, means that it's not just what you would call imagination. It's not what's happening here. We have computation going on. So the first pattern, so what we do when we ask participants to do this is we ask the correct answer. Of course, we, we measure how correct or how wrong they are, but we also measure how long it took them to answer. So what we call reaction time. And we have two types of uh, effects. The first one is effectively when you do this task away from the now and here. So whether you're in Dubai, Cayenne, nine years in the future, nine years in the past, you take longer to respond and you make more errors. So that means for us psychologists, like when we look at this data, it means that in fact something has changed when I told you, you know, project yourself in nine years or in the past or in the future, or you're in Dubai and so on. You effectively did something, your brain did something, and it was costly because you make more errors and it, it's longer to respond to. And the second interesting pattern um, is that the further away the events are, wherever you are mentally, and whether it's in space or time, the faster you are at responding. So the easier it is, the further away it is, which is counterintuitive but not so much so because we're dealing with memory. And if I were to ask you, what did you do yesterday at this time, it would be sort of crowded in your mind because you have many events from, that you remember from yesterday. But if I ask you one year ago, you would have uh, at a specific time, at a partic salient event, you, you know, your birthday or something, it would be, you actually would be faster. You have less noise, so to speak, around that event. So it's not totally counter. Uh, Counterintuitive. So basically, this design, by the way, was highly inspired by a researcher called Arzi, who demonstrated this for time already. So we replicated in different manner what he had shown for episodic memory. Here we don't have episodic memory. And we extended it to space. So now we have patterns of effect behaviorally that tells us, yes, perhaps time and space in the brain seem to look alike, and maybe it's the same. So we went with fMRI now. So now we're asking the question, where in the brain is the, are these processes happening? And I'll skip through so I can maintain my hour because these are experimental details you don't need to know to understand, I think, the story. So that I skip as well. And this is the clearest uh, picture. So we don't actually find the same regions in the brain that are being, uh, well, not all regions are shared between the spatial task and the temporal task. Everything that is about time is in red. Everything that is about space is in blue. And so if you look at the human brain here, uh, fMRI during doing this task, you can see that there are some common areas that are, I'm not sure if they show up here, perhaps not in the purple, but, um, and what you can suddenly see is that the blue part that are dealing with spatial representation are much more posterior in the brain, and the red parts dealing with time are much more frontal in the brain. So we do have some clear dissociation between the areas engaged in these two tasks. And these blue areas are, in fact, what have been shown uh, many times in virtual reality uh, from the Burgess Group in London and many other groups for, that are, in fact, used for spatial navigation. So the cool part here is that we don't use a real navigation in space. The participant is not moving in space. It's not even moving in a virtual reality. It, we only gave him words and we just ask him to imagine that he's moving in space. And we recruit the same regions as what you may use to map space. So that's pretty cool. OK. Uh, there was one region in particular that was interesting and in overlap between time and space, which was in the parietal cortex, uh, which seems to compute the distance with respect to self, irrespective of what that distance is. It can be time. It can be space. So an event that occurred nine years ago, uh, uh, nine kilometers away, for instance, or even the social distance. Something that has to do with an abstract representation of distance to self. And, over, and I'm building this not on our result, but also on other results in the, in the field. Now, okay, this is fun and nice, but the problem here, I'm talking to you about distance, and really, if we have a mental arrow, we expect an order. We want a sequence, right? We want to see things happening as not as uh, being further or away from you, because this would be a sort of a absolute uh, magnitude of something. We want to have one, two, three, four things that are ordered in your mental time. And we don't see that with fMRI. So the way we sort data and so on, we don't see it. So then we went with MEG because with MEG we have temporal resolution. And perhaps this sort of process is very fast. So we did the same experiment with MEG. And this is what we get. So basically, for my eyes, this is the time arrow. <laughs> 
And this is the distance. <laughs> now I'm going to explain to you. <laughs> Um, this is the amplitude of the brain response that we observed we, when recording with MEG. And this is the distance from the mental reference you were in. So remember in, t in time. So you can be nine years in the past, you can be now, or you can be nine years in the future. All of them are combined. So mentally, you're in a reference that is your self-reference. It's not the physical reference anymore. It's not the real now, the, the past, future, and so on. We all align everything into where you are mentally, irrespective of whether you're in the past or in the future. And all of these dots are the different events, historical events, around those references. So we're in a mental reference of time. We're not anymore in the physical reference of time. And what you can see is that we have either a decreased amplitude, we're in the minus, or we go and have an uh, um, increased amplitude of this brain response. When you're in the past, you have a decreased engagement of that area. When you're in the future, you have an increased engagement of that area. That area is in the middle temporal uh, cortex. There are technical details that make us believe that it might be the hippocampus, which is the spatial navigation system, but we are now running... Uh, it, this is technical details. So, but this is, uh, in that region, potentially, effectively capitalizing on a spatial navigation system. And this is... So the same sort of representation, but as you can see here, you don't have a sign difference. So whether you're in the past or in the future, you have a relationship with how distant the event is from your mental reference, but you're not signed, so you don't have a decrease of information, so you don't really know whether you're in the past or the future, but you know how distant the event is. Now, this being said, so this is, um, this is for us the signature of something that looks more like the, the mental time arrow, but you can, because of a task, do the exact same analysis on the spatial part. And the spatial part would show you similar kind of results. So then you can ask, even though we have different brain regions, whether we have the same sort of algorithm being used in this task for mapping events in time and space, just in different brain regions. That's sort of a question. And I'm going to end this by simply um, with a couple things. So this whole talk is simply to say that if we really want to understand the mind, uh, I really think that we need to understand the time dimension in the brain. That's, that's the whole point here, is to understand how the brain is somehow dissociating, capable of dissociating itself from the mental timeline of the external observer and try to reason in terms of what mental matrix is available to the self or to the brain itself. That's sort of the idea. Oscillations are contentious. I talked to you about neural oscillations. It is one-sided view in neuroscience, so it is not a consensual, consensual approach in neuroscience, which, as you know, is a very young science, so there's a lot of debates going on. Uh, so I'm being cautious about it, but the idea is, um, has been there for quite a while. I did not cite all of the people, but pr probably one of the uh, origins, uh, original thinker about this is Ernst Popper from the, from the 70s, has a nice chapter about this. And, uh, and also this notion of autonomy, I think, can be found in, uh, in Yogi, Bozaki's, uh, Yogi Bozaki's work. And I'll just cite that for the fun because I really like it. This is from a psychologist. Okay, and then I will thank the uh, different people that contributed to this. So uh, Baptiste Gauthier is on the mental time travel. Leticia Gabo, who talked about the order bias in the, in the psychology. Anne, who did the uh, non-stationarity in the phase of oscillation, and Tadeusz Kononovich, with whom we're working still on uh, metacognition and temporal production. We have cool results, but I have no time for this. So, voila. And I'm open for questions. Okay, thanks, uh, Prof. Van Pazenhoff, for the fascinating talk. Now, time for questions. Uh, I, I would like to ask you uh, the way you are doing this uh, at, at the first part of your ex presentation. Uh, you are uh, trying to see the simultaneity of uh, sound events and light events. Mm -hmm. You know that light is uh, instantaneous. Sound is, uh, is propagating. I don't know uh, the way it was done, but at 330 meters per mm -hmm. second in air. So, uh, and, and if I remember, the time that you are giving, it's about 100 milliseconds or less. Mm -hmm. 
and in 100 milliseconds, sound is doing uh, 30 meters. And uh, so, I mean, after you can say it's done, I mean, you have uh, what is the uh, number of people, how they are put in a, uh, is there done by, by, uh, by using cask or something like that? I mean, that, that's a number of questions for, yeah. for a physicist at least. Yeah, yeah, so there's been a lot of work done on this in a, what, what we call multi-sensory integration. So there's a whole field of study which is not timing per se, but that's interesting into why we see objects in the world as multi-sensory events, basically. Because I am, for instance, a person that emits light or reflect lights, emits sounds uh, that you could touch and so on. So in the brain, there has to be a unified representation of that event. And that's where this notion of simultaneity comes, comes from. Um, the idea, there are some data showing that you have what has been called the horizon of simultaneity. So you have... I think the distance is about 10 meters within which you don't really compensate for the difference of speed and light, and then above which the brain starts compensating for this difference. That's the physical aspect of it. Then you have to enter into what uh, Semi Ezeki already talked about, just even within the visual system, the fact that you have neural latencies that are going to be different. So in auditory cortex, a sound is going to arrive at a roughly 10 milliseconds in your cortex, after already a lot of processing, in fact. There are different stages already that have sort of established where approximately the sound would be and so on. And in visual cortex, it would be roughly 50 milliseconds, I think. So from what I recall, but uh, expert in the room, so. Uh, but I, I think there are new data now showing that it might be earlier, so it's. Uh, and this one has not been processed yet. So it's, it's almost like you have a, a in a way, a natural compensation of delayed mechanisms by, photos, um, by the photo tran uh, transcription into the retina and so on that delays the processing of the visual with the sound, which may already somewhat compensate for the delays in speeds. And then you have, you have different kind of mechanisms. You also have like these integration windows. So the, the idea that uh, eventually the, um, you don't necessarily need to wait for the latency of this signal to be aligned at zero, or to be synchronous, as much as being within a temporal tuning of, of neurons. So for instance, multisensory neurons, that are neurons that can respond to both sound and light, can have tuning function, can accept delays from zero. Some will peak at zero. Their response will be maximal when there's if a delay. Or you can have 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, some in prefrontal cortex can go as much as one second. So it's almost like you have these temporal coincidence detector in some ways that are naturally implemented in the brain. So it's very complicated. What I'm trying to say is even if you try to manipulate the physical part, you still have to deal with the, confronted with the, the, the hardwired mm -hmm. part. And to respond to the simplest question, which was uh, how do you do this experimentally? Participants are sitting within a distance where speed does not matter because you're something like one meter at most visually and you hear through headphones or, at, or through speakers. <coughs> and at that distance, the, I think that I once computed you would be like something in the microsecond range so it wouldn't be detectable for, yeah. Yeah, it's a 10 microseconds. Yeah, so you, the, between, between, be, within audition it would because 10 microseconds in audition would give you a spatialization of a sound. But between vision and audition, you, you, you would not detect. It's too small. It's beyond your capacity, temporal capacity, I think. So, yeah. So thank you very much. I have got two or three questions. First of all, you just spoke about the integrated representation of events, but I think everything you told us this morning shows that there is not an integrated representation yes. of events. And then you spoke about this work on, somatic, on, on sensory integration. What has this work shown about integration in the brain? Because my contention is it has shown nothing. How, I mean, do you know, do we know today, and this is a serious question, mm -hmm. do we know how integration occurs? Because I don't think it does. So, to link the two points, I think your point is really well taken. All of what I've talked about here to discuss about order is about segregation. And mm -hmm. I think it's interesting because you're in a mode where you're not integrative. So I agree with you on that. 
For the uh, part of the integration of multi-sensory, that's a contentious point, and I'm not going to be uh, necessarily uh, taking one side, although I could. <laughs> I would say if you're a basic neuroscientist and you're not thinking about the mind or representation and so on, you know that there are multi-sensory neurons that are going to be integrating. And what integrating means in that case means you have a neuron, an anti clear cell that is going to receive sound, visual events, tactile events, and that's going to be more responsive when you have both combined at the same time in the same spatial location, the response is going to be bigger. So this is a fact, this is observable, it's been well done. How this relates to perception is a bit more ambiguous. Um, I could go and uh, talk at length about this because uh, I think it's, it's less ambiguous when you go in the speech domain. Because well, speech is clear, you have an integrated percept, right? If you see someone saying ba, so the point here, so for no, the non-neuroscientist, non the point here is if you see someone speaking and you hear me, your brain is going to use visual information from my face, integrated in that case with the sound to make it clearer. It's, I mean, it's as if you were turning up the volume. And for this, I think there's no point of contention. For speech, you have an integrated percept because you have a word. You have a syllable ba, you have a word, word. But if you have a beep and a flash, it doesn't make sense for the brain necessarily, and that's where I, I think I follow your reasoning, to integrate this information because there's no category in the brain for a beep flash. Yeah, but, but look, you, you have got, you, you say these cells, I mean, there are not many of them as far as I recall, which, which uh, respond to both light and auditory stimuli, visual and auditory stimuli, mm -hmm. all right? And yet in spite of this, you see these things, uh, the, the events are, sens uh, are, are separate. Yeah. Right, they appear as though they they have come together, but there is so these. If you do the experiments, you find that these cells, if they exist, are impotent of integrating. So uh, I just want to know: a, if anyone has actually shown an integration which is consonant in time and in space and in percept, because I think that what happens in perception is different to what happens in vertical time. And I think that the method of integration is occurred by a coincidence detector saying this and this happened within the same time interval, not by physiological interaction between cells. But, but I didn't talk at all about integration, so I'm not sure why. No, 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 well, you, no you did. You did. No, you just said, to you, a question. No, 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 you said that our cells do sensory, uh, the, the, uh, sensory sure, integration. To, to answer I'm, a particular question, but not in this talk, right? I don't talk about integration here. Well, whether you talk about it in this talk or not, it's an no. interesting point to raise. Uh, so, so, so the question that I'm different. asking you is, since you've shown such discrete event, mm -hmm. and since there's been 40 years of work on sensory integration, has anyone shown convincingly that this occurs by physiological interaction between cells? That's the question I'm asking. Because if they have not, we've got to change our, our approach and say, well, this occurs in a different way, because we perceive things as if they do occur simultaneously. I think it's too vast a question. I mean, you, you know, you can have the cellular approach, as I say, we know that there are multi-sensory neurons, so they, they show integration. I don't know how it relates necessarily. I mean, there are different studies that I could go through in terms of how they correlate with integration, but then I could talk about large-scale integration through oscillations. But I'm not talking about integration today, so I'm... No, no, but the know? picture I take, I take from your talk yeah. is that of discrete events, yeah. all right? No, no, no integrated events. Yeah. So I'm asking how, does, how do you, because in perception you see these things as integrated, we, we will experience it's, them. But it's task related, so we, I, I mean I can show you data on speech, and in speech for me there would be no controversy that you do integrate audition and vision into an abstract representation. So I do believe that you have some forms of abstract representation from speech, and they can go through predictive coding mechanisms to where information from one sensory modality and from the, can inform the, the processing of the other, in which case you have a form of integration which is not just summation or superadditivity like multisensory. You do have dynamics in this. So it's, it's at the larger scale, so to speak. But I'm, I, I, know, I can tell I'm not answering your question, so I'm, uh, you can tease me afterwards again. <laughs> now, the, the brain itself has uh, the unconscious, subconscious, and conscious part largely. We understand it in those terms. Mm 
The unconscious part is really concerned about now responding to whatever is happening at the moment. It doesn't care about the future. For example, what we eat or something, that there's a threat or whatever to escape and so on. The subconscious part appears to be, well, rooted in the past, but has to deal with the present. So responses to situation based on experience and so forth uh, to respond to the present. The future is always about uh, where the conscious part of the brain seems to deal with. And it's about what's there out there in the future, but it tries to um, like get whatever it needs, the, the, the analysis or the, the data, or whatever it needs from the past. Because for the, few, for the conscious part, everything is, the data is always in the past, even if it happens now, by the time it starts processing, it's already in the past. Now in such a situation, in your research, have you found any evidence to suggest the relevance of these three, uh, like the past, present, and future, and uh, the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious part of the brains? Have you, has anything been revealed? Now, my, what I'm presenting is based on my own you know, layman's understanding. So I'm trying to understand from your research. Thank you. Um, that's a complicated question. So I avoid, the, I personally in my research, I avoid most of the time this notion of conscious, subconscious, and so on, because they are driven by heavy theoretical approach, and one needs to define exactly you know, which side you take, uh, theoretically. Uh, in this particular line of work, I'm not looking at necessarily the relationship between past, present, and future. We have different data in which we look at a phenomenon which is called um, post-diction, and that goes into the sort of, a, in psychology, has been called backward masking or retroperception more recently, which is that an event occurring after the presentation of, so you have event one, two, three, for instance, the second event is going to be perceived according to event three. So the future is going to retroactively affect the, your, your perception of event two, for instance. Uh, so there are some illusory experiments when you can, in fact, have this notion. I mean, what it relates to is the fact that you have this uh, sort of thickness of the present, right? This integration time, so to speak, that is not punctual, but it's going to consider several events or in some ways to either retroactively or, or, um, or integrate information within a particular time window. Uh, the second part, I would say that since, I would say, uh, 15 or 20 years perhaps now, uh, well, really for more than a century, but um, there are more formal models now of this notion of prediction, right? So in fact, one of the reasons I went into the time which was not originally my, uh, my questionings, was the fact that uh, we have a lot of uh, data showing that um, an event that you process now is going to be conditioned, so to speak, or predicted by events that occurred before, or your knowledge, or your you know, statistical representation of the world. It depends on where you come from. And this basically acts as a prediction of what happens in the <coughs> next future that's happening. And when you think about this, it means that when you look from the external observer point of view, these dynamics in the brain, you don't necessarily know whether the kind of representation that are there are dealing with past events, processing actual data now, or eventually anticipating future events. And all three of them are probably mixed, especially with the kind of techniques we use non-invasively with humans, right? Where we don't have the resolution to try and tease these things apart. Uh, perhaps I, I should mention where I'm coming from. Um, as a layman, I, I, mean, I got these ideas after reading uh, um, Thales Nudge and his, you know, his idea about nudging things, uh, somebody to make a decision, and also Kahneman's and Savansky's uh, uh, fast play thinking and slow yes. thinking. Yes. Yeah, yeah it comes from that, yeah. that school. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, I see, okay. Virginie, thank you so much for that. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, the thing that struck me was that a lot of the experiments seem to assume what economists would call um, 
homogeneous agents, that all people are similar, and that we can therefore make comparisons across their, their brains, right, in this case. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there have been other experiments where you allow for heterogeneity amongst people. So for instance, do the brains of artists show different sorts of patternings from mm -hmm mathematicians, for instance, or people who meditate versus people who don't meditate. I'm curious because I'm wondering whether there is a degree of neuroplasticity at work there, mm. um, or at least in terms of if we exercise our brains in different ways, will we show different patterns? So uh, that's an interesting question. There's a lot of work to be done in that realm. For time in particular, you have a lot of um, groups that are looking at musicians, for instance, right, who, who are highly trained in uh, temporal perception. Um, Actually, what I'm interested in is somewhat of the opposite. Uh, and that's where the term chronoarchitecture, uh, I very much like from uh, Semir uh because what I'm interested in is what are the constraints that the dynamics are giving? Which kind of constraint dynamically do we have to deal with uh, for each brain? So not so much how much you, you have plasticity, which to some extent you could consider that attention affords you some form of rapid plasticity, so to speak, in the very early uh, uh, graph with, uh, which, where I showed you the gray zone uh, of, of variability. And I'm in fact interested in inter individual, I'm interested in individual brains and their dynamic constraints. So sort of this notion of architecture, how you're going to be constrained by this. Um, but that's an interesting question. I mean, some groups are looking, uh, yeah, musician would be interesting to look at. In one of your slides, you men um, mentioned uh, uh, Lewis Carroll uh, that uh, you know, instead of uh, the present being closer to you, it's further away. And this relates to the Amara people from uh, South America. I find it very interesting because this is uh, very exceptional. So is there something of great significance that we can draw from this uh, phenomena. For instance, if we look at the Amara people, right, is there something very striking about uh, them that we don't see in the rest of the world's uh, population? Um, I can't answer that question because I'm not an expert on that people, but I think there's, there would be a lot of work to, that need to be done. So in another study, they looked, for instance, as um, to which extent ancestors would be important in the mental timeline or in the way you think about yourself in this sort of uh, timescape, I would say, that, uh, that was mentioned a couple of days ago. Um, and the way of different social attributes may play in the directionality that you might use. Um, there's not so much work, so I cannot draw really big conclusions, but yeah, it's on, there's um, some ongoing work, there are a couple of groups on that. It's a very interesting question. Um, I seem to remember in one of Richard Feynman's books, he tells a story about when he was a graduate student and he and his office mate, I think it was Tukey, they were both discovered, they were very good at, at discovering when 60 seconds had passed and then they wanted to, started experimenting themselves as to what things would interfere with that. And I think one of them was reading something, one of them was um, reading out loud, one was, and what he says in the book is that the discovery they made about each other was that they thought about numbers differently. That one of them thought of numbers very visually and one of them thought of numbers very auditorially or something. And that depending on which way they thought about numbers, an activity that was more visual or more auditory interfered with their ability to, to be able to estimate when 60 seconds passed. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I read it thinking, and I think maybe even has a sentence or two saying, and this would be a great topic for somebody to research on, because it was just him and his uh, office mate doing this together. But is this something people have studied? Yes, uh, so that's one of the theory that I did not mention, because it has to deal with time as um, duration or quantity. So there are classic experiments, even dating back from 50s and 60s, that, are look at, that have looked at the interference between time and number. Um, I guess historically there's a sort of divide at some point in the 50s, 60s where people, I guess, started really thinking about the brain as a computer and figured out whether time would be digitized in some ways, discretized, right? Do you need to discretize time? 
And at that time, when you look at the literature, there's sort of a split between people thinking in terms of numbers and people thinking in terms of time. And these are two now separate line of research, but there are a few uh, uh, theory out there. So one of them is called the theory of magnitude by Vincent Walsh, uh, that suggests that all of the analog uh, features, so to speak, are going to be mapped in the same uh, brain system. So in there, you would have distance, loudness, uh, I don't know, luminance, uh, lots of uh, attribute, feature attribute that can be quantified as uh, analog would be there. So that's one theory that is being actively uh, looked at with some effects of interference across dimensions. The experiments that you mentioned that uh, Feynman played, uh, it would be more relevant to the kind of interference we see between what we call working memory or attention and your uh, perception of duration. So classic effects are that if you pay attention to time, it's going to dilate as we call duration, so you perceive duration, which is what you experienced, some of you perhaps, with this red uh, arrow before. Uh, and then if you start uh, having a sort of a distractors with a lots of information in your mind that you have to process at the same time, and that includes counting, uh, or remembering events that have been presented just before, visual image, and so on, you're going to have a parametric decrease of your estimation of time. And the problem is, how do you dissociate? Because when you have things to maintain in memory, you also pay attention to these things in memory a priori. So then you have sort of these two effects that are going to have an impact on this. And uh, yeah, that's as far as I could go on that one. <laughs> Coffee time. We have still time for questions. I think they want coffee. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think you made it very easy for even for a layman like me to follow. OK, thanks. Uh, and, but I don't have your vocabulary, so my question would be very simple. Uh, at some point, you mentioned that uh, it's, it's dip easier for me to remember what happened on my birthday five years ago than what I ate for breakfast, something like that, you said? Uh, yeah. In yeah. terms of recalling facts? Yeah. It's faster, yeah. It's faster. Now, does it also have to do with density, like how many things happened uh, around some event? Or is it you only can, you, I think you can conceptualize it that way. Yeah. Density. Yes. It's a Thank form you. of density. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, and when I was in the Netherlands, I heard a presentation from um, a brain scientist who was really looking to the young adult brain. And she discovered that it was still growing and that's one of the reasons that maybe your teenagers might behave like they do and that you should be more understanding as an adult, I just remembered. But if you look at your data, do you see a difference between young adults and more mature adults? Or is that not a topic that you've delved into yet? Yeah, I haven't gone into this, but that would be a very interesting question to look at the developmental stages. Uh, there's a um, researcher, Sylvie Droitvolé, in the field who is specialized in the, uh, in the um, infant, not in the brain side necessarily, but more in the perceptual aspect. And she, just, she effectively shows differences in duration perception across ages. So that's an interesting topic, but I haven't done research on it. Yeah. Thank you. I just have a very elementary question, trying to put this wonderful story together, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it, congratulations on a fantastic talk. Thank Early you. on, you had a, a graph with, uh, I think it was blue and green, blue and red uh, dots, and it was discriminating between auditory and visual responses. And I've been trying to remember if that had to do with the subjects, or if that was part of the, do those, what is, what is the, what is the, what were you showing with that graph, the difference? Yeah, I'll show, I'll show you again. Okay. So you're a visual person, you remember the, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I should have listened more. Okay. Uh, let me. It's the interaction of these two coordinate systems and then the dilation change, but that, this was like a building block for that. Uh, that there is I think it's this one. Red uh, and blue dots? Yeah, yes, that one, exactly. That's the one. Does it show? Uh, yeah. Uh, 
here you have each individual participant, and here you have the delays, no, sorry, here you have the uh, simultaneity threshold. So what, what is the delay, physical delay they need to consider these events as, as being simultaneous? Not necessarily integrated, but simultaneous. <laughs> um, and the point here is to say that when you don't give in the, in the uh, purple, when you don't give any instruction, so you don't ask them to pay particularly attention to sound or vision. When you red, you pay attention to vision. When you blue, you pay attention to audition. So this here is the magnitude with which attention can make you vary your percept of simultaneity. And this is as a function of participants. So what you can see is the further away you are from what a physicist would call a veridical simultaneity with instrumentation, <coughs> the further away you are, the more you tend to be able to shift with your attention. That's another secondary effect that seemed interesting, except for this outlier here. But mostly the more, more extreme participants seem to be shifting more, and when you tend to perceive the sound first, you're also more flexible, apparently, here. But we didn't really quantify that. So the main point here is that you, if you wanted a world where everyone can synchronize exactly the same with very decal simultaneity, you would want everyone to be on the zero here one way or another at some point, whether they shift attention to audition and vision. So I'm extrapolating very far here. Uh, I, I wouldn't say these things in my f tiny field, but to, to, that would be the, uh, you know, it would require five more experiments to really nail that down. But, um, so this is totally consistent. Every, every participant is tested twice, once auditory, once visual. And they you were, see this yes, effect. they were tested uh, three or four times and four times in the course of four months. So they came four times to the lab. Mm. So it's uh, consistent, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We could take one last short question, if there is any. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure this is an answerable question, but it kind of goes much deeper, but it's a very simple question. And that is, you know, one of the extraordinary characteristics of human beings is indeed that we can contemplate and fantasize about the future and, uh, and even contemplate our own death. Uh, and that does not seem to be true anywhere else in the biological kingdom. No other animal, I mean, if it is, it's trivial compared to what we can do. Mm. And um, so I have two questions. One sort of has been asked already. But one is, um, so for, oh, the other thing is that nevertheless, um, other animals have extraordinarily acute perception of space, often much more so than we do. Mm -hmm. So uh, where is it? What, what is it in the brain, in, in our brain, that is so different than other brains of other animals? that makes this extraordinary distinction. Of course, this is a much deeper question, clearly. <laughs> but also, it, this is the part that's been asked, in our own development, since our brain sort of seems to stop growing when we're four or five years old, that's it. Where along that pathway did this start to occur? You know, I mean, or, or was it, is it already built in a priori? These are big and deep questions. <laughs> Well, I mean, you have the. I mean, that's what you're showing us all these pictures. Well, so uh, the question is: Has is there any possibility of doing similar kinds of? You, you know, you've got very clever experiments here. Maybe you can be even more clever and do similar experiments on animals. So there's actually a clever uh, researcher, uh, Clayton, and she's studying blue jays, birds, oh. and. She has, in fact, shown that these blue jays have some form of mental... Well, she claims, right, that they have some form of mental time travel. So they have some... Not as um, extensive as the one you mentioned with respect to the capacity we have to reflect on death, right? That we cannot interrogate the blur bird about this. Or perhaps some researcher can, but... Uh, what she's looking at is how good they are at planning their food schedule 
according to the decay of that food. And they can quite well anticipate, you know. With, so there are some protoforms, so to speak, of foresight that are quite uh, remarkable already across species. Uh, in terms of development, uh, it's true that you have these critical periods in brain development after which it gets difficult to develop particular faculties. But you do preserve some form of plasticity for lots of things all the way through mm -hmm. the years. So uh, it's, again, a very complex question with respect to the foresight, and I wouldn't be the uh, expert on this one. But that's super interesting, yeah. Okay. I guess we can take these intricate questions over the coffee break. Let us now put our hands together, to Professor Van. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Shall I go to the